This video is for education and entertainment purposes only. Please consult with your healthcare provider before making any changes to your health plan. Hey, beautiful soul. It's Jacqueline from the Las Labia Chronicles in partnership with Lichen Sclerosis Support Network. If you have lichen sclerosis and are looking to empower yourself with information, find acceptance and reclaim your life, then please subscribe to our channel and keep on watching. And if you have a friend or family member or loved one with lichen sclerosis, and you want to learn more about the physical and mental health aspects of living with lichen sclerosis so that you can better support them in their journey, then please keep on watching and please share this with them as well. All right, today I am super excited to be joined by the brilliant Dr. Corey Babb, and we are going to be talking about all things hormones and lichen sclerosis. We know this is a very hot topic. We get a lot of questions, and I've got them kind of all compiled, so we are going to be addressing those today. So as always, if you find the information in this video helpful, then please give us a like and leave us a comment. All right, so some of you are probably quite familiar with Dr. Babb. He just gave a couple of excellent presentations at the 2023 Holistic Healing Summit, which was hosted by Lichen Sclerosis Support Network. You might know him from social media, his TikTok and Instagram. They're very, very popular. He's got a lot of great educational and uh, entertaining content around all things kind of bubble vaginal health related. Um, but if you're not familiar with Dr. Corey Babb, he is a board certified gynecologist. He is a fellow with the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, also known as Ishwish. He is a non-certified menopause practitioner and also a member of the International Society for the Study of Bubble Vaginal Dis Disorders, which is also known as the ISSVD. And he has his own practice called the Haven Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where he sees and treats a number of kind of complex vulvovaginal genital pelvic conditions. So Dr. Bab, I would love to know before we kind of go into the hormone stuff, how did you end up in this kind of genital pelvic space anyways? Did you kind of start med school thinking, yes, I want to do gynecology or did you kind of pivot later on in your career? Sure. Um, so, you know, I think I may have told you before, my, my dad was an OBGYN. Um, now he was primarily an obstetrician. So, you know, he was just delivering babies. That was his okay. shtick. Um, when I, my college degree is actually in music composition. Um, and so <laughs> I wanted, when I went to med school, I actually wanted to be a laryngologist and help people with voice disorders. Um, you know, and so I think maybe like the summer before med school started or, or couple, maybe my end of my senior year of college, I, I did just shadowed a laryngologist and I was like, oh, this is kind of boring. I don't know if I really want to do this. And so I started when I started med school, really kind of thinking about the types of patients I wanted to see, kind of what I wanted to do. And for a long time, I actually wanted to do reproductive endocrinology and infertility. So I did a lot of extra training in that. And I think that's really why I feel really comfortable with hormone therapy. Um, and so then the bat kind of pushed me into the women's health, you know, whole spectrum. And then, you know, did that training and then kind of have subspecialized into my niche that I, that I have now. So, yeah. Well, that is quite the journey. Definitely some unpredictable turns of events from music right. composition to vocal cords to fertility and hormones and then genital pelvic. But hey, we are glad to have you here. Um, so one of the things I wanted us to start with was the question of what are hormones? And the reason I want to start with this question is that there are a lot of words in our vocabulary that we use on a day-to-day -day basis where if a stranger stopped and said, hey, what does that mean? We might not be able to answer. Mm -hmm. I've been using the terms hormones and hormonal since I was a teen, right? I'd be like, don't get mad at me. I'm just PMSing. It's my right, hormone. Right. <laughs> Without having any idea of what I actually meant by that, it was just kind sure. of society told me, you're acting funny, it's your hormones. But it's like, do we even know what hormones are? So I'd like us to kind of start with what are hormones and what's their role in the body? Yeah, so so simply put, hormones are chemical messengers. They basically tell 
target tissue, whatever that may be, to do something. And so they're produced from what are called endocrine glands, and there's you know any number of those throughout the entire body. And basically, they have a special kind of targeting mechanism on them that says, well, I'm going to go to this tissue or this tissue. So, you know, and one hormone can affect many different tissues. You know, it's not like they're just, this only goes mm -hmm. to here. So, you know, in the reproductive world, estradiol, for instance, which is a type of estrogen, has receptors obviously in the reproductive tract, but also on the skin and the joints and the brain and the eyes. Like, so just because it's, you know, we mainly think of it in one specific area doesn't mean that it's not affecting things outside of that, you know, sometimes at the whole other end of the body, if you will. Right, right. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. I think when we think about estrogen, estradiol, we typically think pelvic right, and kind of stop there, right? It's kind of that strict area and, and nothing else, not realizing that it can affect our whole body, which I think is a very important point and something that we're probably going to come back to uh, in a bit. Yeah. So I was curious. Um, so Luca et al. just put out a paper, the Lichen Sclerosis Update 2023. And in that paper, they were saying that hormones could potentially be a risk factor for lichen sclerosis and that there may be some kind of hormonal component to lichen sclerosis, but that we don't really understand that fully and that there's still a lot of controversy around the role that hormones may or may not play in lichen sclerosis. So curious sure. to know if you have any insight on that. Yeah, I mean, so, and this is one of the kind of neat things, I guess, if you will, about this area of medicine is that it's, we're learning stuff all the time. You know, you could say, extrapolate that to really any kind of thing in medicine, but really in, you know, LS or this kind of vulvovaginal genitopelvic sphere, it's kind of the redheaded stepchild of the body. You know, it's kind mm -hmm. of, people focus on that last, unless it's the penis, and then they focus on that, you know, very, very right. frequently. But, um, so we, we obviously know that LS specifically has a strong correlation to estrogens in that if you look at that, you know, the kind of who gets LS most, it's typically people at those low hormonal ends of the spectrum. So prior to puberty and in the case of, you know, with the uterus postmenopause. Now, obviously, you know, you know, you can mm -hmm. get it anytime. Yeah, uh, sure yeah. Can. <laughs> but you know so so we know that kind of low hormone states do predispose the tissue if there is kind of that little you know all i mean it predisposes the pre you know disposition basically of the tissue to convert into that um and when you're looking at autoimmune diseases in general this is something that we you know we see there's typically some sort of trigger whether that's environmental, stress, illness, whatever it is, that causes that immune response to occur. And so, you know, it, it's, I totally feel there's, a, you know, a hormonal component to who gets it or who doesn't, you know, if you will. I guess the big question is, and this is the one that we don't know yet, is, well, why? You know, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. And so maybe there is that predisposition, but it also doesn't mean that it's the whole story. Right. Um, so people in those kind of hypoestrogenic states may be more predisposed, but obviously, you know, I had symptoms in my 20s, got diagnosed at 31. That means there's a whole group of people in that kind of premenopausal reproductive age whose main trigger, main predisposition may not necessarily be a hypoestrogenic state. And so maybe there's something yeah. else going on there. When you think of the like extra genital manifestations of it too, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you know, I think I, I either told you, I can't remember if I sent you a message or I just shared, you know, I had a patient that we looked at it and we found it behind their ear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? I and remember so you said that. There, There's nothing genital about this tissue, you know, back here. And yeah. so... Yes, hormone, obviously, you know, hormones in general do play a role in the skin, but that in itself, you know, is kind of like, well, why, you know, did you get it there? Like, what does that right. have to do with, you know, puberty or whatever? So, mm -hmm. yeah, it just goes to show how complex right. lichen sclerosis really is. So it's not there's like one clear cause or predisposition or trigger for everyone. It can be a little bit different. And yep. then, yeah. If we talk about getting LS other areas of the body, that brings in a whole nother kind of 
conversation. Um, so a lot of people that we talk to tend to say that they feel that their LS might be hormonally triggered. And what they mean by this is that there are people, and I'm not one of them, but there are people who say that their symptoms tend to flare or at least increase a little, either around the time that they ovulate or right before they menstruate or when they're menstruating. So right. could you maybe comment on like what might be going on in those types of cases, why they're seeing that spike? Sure. So, you know, when you look at the menstrual cycle as a whole, and this is going back to estrogens, you know, you get a dip in estradiol levels prior to ovulation, and then especially in about the week or so prior to menstruation. So, you know, if you have a tissue that is very sensitive to this, and for some reason, you know, like it, it you get that drop, then there's, that's kind of a trigger to cause potentially a flare. The other thing that we know, especially with menstruation, is that there is a release of a lot of chemical, what are called prostaglandins, mm -hmm which are things that kind of promote inflammation. They, they make, you know, they decrease your pain threshold, things like that. And so those really flare too. So not only in the case of the premenstrual LS flares, are you getting a hormonal drop, but you're also seeing an increase in these things that are going to make you feel worse. So your pain may be worse, your itching may be worse, or, you know, as this is an inflammatory condition, now you've raised those inflammatory markers and, you know, ergo, you've got that flare. Right. So quite a few things that could be contributing. That was really interesting. When I do hair removal, my technician always tells me not to go during certain times because I'm going to be, uh, my pain sensitivity is going to be reduced exactly. and things are going to feel more painful. So that's kind of playing into what you're, you just mentioned. So I'm like, okay, so we've got kind of two things potentially at play here with that dip in estrogen, but then also that increased, you know, sensitivity to pain and kind of external stimulus. So that definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, what would you recommend for people who do experience that? who do say, you know, I use my steroids, I use them properly, I'm on maintenance and things are good overall, but that week before menstruation, I just get into a wicked flare. What do I do? Yeah. So and there, there's a lot of things I think that you can do with that, you know, looking at, you know, both that kind of prostaglandin side of things, as well as the hormonal, you know, so mm -hmm. In those patients, I would ask them, first of all, are you noticing a significant emotional fluctuation in that week prior as well? Because if they are, then you can do just some estradiol supplementation like that one week before their period starts, and that can help those symptoms too. The other thing you can do is looking on the prostaglandin side of things. So if you are regular, you know, mm -hmm. in your cycle, uh, you know, usually we say for menstrual pain, you start taking some sort of anti-inflammatory three days kind of around the clock before the start of your period. So you can extrapolate that and say, well, if I know that I start to kind of get those flare symptoms about a week before my period, well, if you know that's coming, start taking that kind of, you know, anti-inflammatory. And so, you know, you can use ibuprofen, you can use naproxen, you know, any of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. They're not going to interfere with your, you know, steroid ointments or anything like right. that. Um, you know, and, and that can be really helpful for, for those symptoms. Yeah, I like that. I know that I've also heard that some doctors will tell them to use birth control kind of strategically, almost to skip. But then I wonder with the birth control, I know a lot of people are apprehensive and don't really like that option because yeah. they kind of don't want to go on that type of medication. And then there's new concerns about what type of birth control is this and how is this going to affect my hormones and can this make my LS worse? So I think a lot of people might be a little bit more comfortable with these two options instead of having to go on the birth control pill. Yeah, no, it's true. You know, the ethanol estradiol, which is the most common type of estrogen that we see in a birth control pill, or actually, honestly, in any estrogen containing contraceptive, um, it really kind of shuts the ovaries down in terms mm -hmm. of ovarian estrogen production. So you're, you know, the organs in the body are kind of inherently lazy. If something else is going to do their work for them, they're going to go on vacation to wherever they go. Um, and so, you know, if you're getting this exogenous, meaning outside of the body, you know, kind of product, you know, 
source of estradiol, you know, then the ovaries are like, man, goodbye. And so that can cause some issues. So you can see some people, if they're really wanting to skip menstruation, doing like a progesterone only contraceptive, mm. Okay. You know, or there's a new drug here in the States. I'm not sure about in Canada. It's called Nextellus. It's a mm. oral birth control pill, but the estrogen in it is, is estetrol, which is an estrogen that is only found in the placenta during pregnancy. Mm. Okay. And so it is not, it doesn't work in the same fashion as ethanol estradiol. You don't have the same type of alteration of sex hormone binding globulin like you do. So, so it's another option that I think you could explore, but right. there's, I mean, it just came out in the last year. So there's not a lot of data on it, you know, by any means. Yeah, fair. And so the, the applying the estradiol like a week before menstruation, mm -hmm. would that be topical? Is that what you're referring to? You, you can, sure. I mean, that's not going to hurt anything. And I think you could make an argument um, that if you have LS, especially if you kind of are in the moderate to severe range, I mean, doing twice a week estradiol, you know, creams or things, it's not. It's definitely not going to hurt anything unless you have very specific, you know, health contraindications. Um, but I mean, I'll give patients just oral estradiol tablets for that kind of week before their period. You know, it's not enough to stop their period, like you're, but it's right. enough to keep that big drop. You know, instead of it being such a huge change, it mm -hmm. kind of is more of a gentle fall as opposed to stepping off the cliff, if you will. You're, right, you're rolling right. down the hill. You're not, yeah. you know, jumping off of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, like off a cliff. We, we don't want that. That's what we're trying. They feel like they're falling off a cliff right now with their flaring with menstruation. Exactly. So yeah. now we want the gentle kind of getting them there. And I think that's a really interesting way to kind of work with that because I, I definitely think that there are people who would definitely seem more sensitive and more prone to kind of hormonal flares than other people. Again, like I myself don't experience that, but I definitely hear a lot of it. So it's nice to hear that there are kind of different options for them uh, because, yeah, most of us menstruate once a month, right? So it's right. kind of like unfortunate like we want something that we can do because we got to deal with this you know once a month so exactly um what do you say so are hormones topical or otherwise are they a treatment for lichen chlorosis so i think that there this is a multifactorial question at its heart you know because obviously can they improve symptoms without a doubt I think though, and, and you know, you've heard me say this over and over again, does it reduce the mm -hmm. likelihood of cancer? Like it, it all comes back to that. And while that is a small, small, small percentage of people that have that, that's still a percentage of people, you know? And so I think, can you use them in conjunction with, you know, your steroids? Absolutely. Like totally mm -hmm. can do that. Not a problem at all. Or would I use that by themselves? Probably not. Right. Yeah. That's what I, I always tell people too. You know, I'm like, there's symptom management, mm -hmm. right? So I can use emollient to, you know, make things less frictiony down right. there. I can use a peri bottle to rinse the urine off after I urinate if I'm experiencing, you know, that. I can use an ice pack to kind of take the edge off of pain and itch. But the ice pack isn't my treatment. Exactly. That's just something that I'm adding into my treatment plan to make my quality of life better, exactly. to decrease my symptoms. So both have a place, but, you know, estrogen, you're not going to give estrogen as a full monotherapy to a patient and tell them this is going to treat your LS. Because exactly. We don't have any evidence that shows that. So it's more of an adjunct. It's something that we're adding in to a treatment program, again, to improve, improve your quality of life, improve symptoms, improve maybe some skin texture and, and appearance. There's a lot of benefits, but just to be transparent, that's not in and of itself what is treating the underlying inflammation with respect right. to like sclerosis. Right. Um, so let's kind of move into perimenopause and the menopausal transition, because sure. this is something that many of us are going to go through at, at some point or other, right? We're all going to, well, not all of us, some people won't, but many of us are going to go through menopause 
And many of us may also go on to experience genitory syndrome of menopause, mm -hmm. uh, also known as GSM. So for, you know, younger folks moving into that kind of stage of their life, what do we kind of need to know with respect to LS and hormones? Like when should we start to include them? What should we be thinking of, et cetera? Yeah. So, you know, if you look at the recommendations from the North American Menopause Society in terms of hormone therapy for both menopausal and perimenopausal people, there are basically kind of three main recommendations in people who go through menopause older than the age of 40. If you go through menopause under 40, it's a whole nother subset of stuff. Right. Um, so the second of those is basically for the treatment of GSM, like you were talking about. And so GSM, you know, as a condition basically is an alteration in the architecture of the genitourinary system, specifically the vulva, the vestibule, and the vagina. And so what happens there is that you have a decrease in the number of what are called superficial cells, which are kind of like the bouncy, spongy, fluid-rich glycogen-containing cells that allow that tissue to stretch and to accommodate right. and that resist damage and tearing and things like that. And so that number goes down and the number of what are called parabasilar cells, which kind of form the architectural like scaffolding of that tissue remains unchanged. So you have this decreased ratio of superficial cells to parabasilar cells. And so that allows that tissue to, it becomes much more friable, easily damaged. You can get the fissuring. It's not as resistant. And so for patients who have LS, if they are starting to notice those kind of changes, whether that's they're looking at the appearance of their, you know, genitalia, you're like, wow, I'm getting some, you know, absorption. I'm seeing some decrease in the, you know, plumpness, if you will, of the labia. I'm having more vaginal dryness. I'm getting more kind of burning with urination, dysuria, any of those things. That's 100% when I would say, hey, get evaluated and, you know, start most likely on therapy at that time. If you are perimenopausal and, 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 you know, if you look statistically, the average person will have between kind of depending on their racial background, anywhere from three to 10 years of perimenopausal symptoms. And that can be your stereotypical hot flashes, night sweats, mood swings, kind of the generic menopause symptoms that can be the vulvovaginal stuff like we were talking about, or it can be things like brain fog you know, irritability, weight gain, especially in their midsection, joint pains, all those kind of things that people don't think about. So if you start having those symptoms and they are affecting your quality of life, and that's kind of the key point there, then that's a time to get evaluated and consider initiating care as well. Mm -hmm. And so what are we talking about at that stage of life? Is it estrogen? Is it estrogen and testosterone? Are there other things that need to be considered? What are we kind of looking at? Assuming the doctor says like, you know, yes, this is definitely kind of GSM or menopause transition related. What kind of things are we looking at? Yeah. Treatment -wise? So, so definitely, I mean, so uh, estradiol specifically is the most potent type of estrogen that's involved with this. You know, if you have a uterus, and you are doing systemic estrogen therapy and you're not having periods so you've actually gone through menopause completely which is defined mm -hmm. as a year without having a period then you need to be on some form of progesterone supplementation as well if you're infrequently having periods you know, you'll say well i have a period like every three months or something i would still probably argue you should be on some form of progesterone too um Testosterone is really interesting, you know, because we, we know that gonadal, so in, the, in people who have ovaries, you know, their ovaries, testicles, you know, the, the gonads, gonadal hormone production starts to decline at, you know, age 30, and mm -hmm. then starts to kind of get gradually worse and worse, or even decline more and more. And when you hit your 40s, it really starts to go down. 
Right. And so that's why we start to see those kind of perimenopausal symptoms happen on average, you know, in, in your early to mid forties, if you look stereotypically. Sure. Um, and so when you're looking at that, yeah, those are the three main hormones you're going to be talking about replacing. And so estradiol, whether that's a topical, you know, just a local thing, whether it's a systemic estradiol, whatever it may be, progesterone, usually systemic, and then testosterone, either systemic or local as well. Right. And then, so I know that a lot of people ask a lot of questions around like, what type of estrogen is best? What brand should I use tablet? Should I use topical? Should I use this or that? So do you have any strong opinions kind of on best practice, like yeah. what you would kind of recommend? And so this information is all it. So the North American Menopause Society puts out kind of an annual or at least a biannual kind of hormone therapy position statement. And so this data comes straight from there. Um, and so, you know, when you're talking about systemic symptoms, so that's going to be your hot flashes, night sweats, kind of things like that. A systemic estrogen therapy, usually in the form of either a patch, a gel, or there is one intravaginal ring here in the States called a fem ring mm, that yes, provides, that. provides systemic therapy is the gold line or gold standard of, of treatment. Now, oral estradiol pills do exist. You can definitely take them. They do increase your risk for elevated cholesterol, and they do have a slight increase in the risk for strokes or other kind of, you know, venous thromboembolic kind of blood clot related issues okay. kind of in the way that they break down. So the transdermal methods are the preferred ways first because we don't see that same increase with them. Pellets are not indicated, endorsed, recommended by any subspecial or any of the main subspecialty societies that is really doing aggressive scientific research into it. There are some kind of fringe societies that, you know, talk about it, but uh, I really, you know, the data is that with those you get routinely get super therapeutic levels of hormone that can be problematic you know, when they're done over kind of a long period of time, especially with testosterone. That's the big one that we usually see mm, uh, okay. causing long-term issues with pellets. I've never, I keep hearing about how pellets are not encouraged. Whenever I hear pellets, it's usually from a medical provider and they're always saying no. And I'm like, what is a pellet? Is it just like a little Tic Tac looking thing? Yeah, and is it exactly. a pellet? Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so basically there are a couple of pellet companies um, and they, you know, usually work with a compounding pharmacy that creates these, and that you're, I think the Tic Tac, it's a perfect analogy. <laughs> and they, they have a set amount of hormone in them, whichever hormone you're, you're pelleting, if you will. And basically you take a hollow bore needle that's a large diameter. Mm -hmm. And usually you do it in your butt and you, the person goes in and they kind of stick the needle in, you know, beneath your, in your tush there. And they mm -hmm. have a little thing and they put kind of poke the pellet in. And depending on the amount of hormone you're wanting to get determines the number of pellets that are there. So, um, and they last on average about three months before, you know, people start to really notice a, a decline in symptoms, but the hormone levels can actually exist or can stay around, can stay elevated for up to, I've seen up to six before. Right. And so it's not uncommon, for instance, with testosterone, you know, we'll have patients come in that are having, you know, uh, facial hair growth, their voice deepening, their clitoris is getting enlarged, and we'll run their testosterone, and it's higher than mine, you know, because they've been getting the pellets. And, and that is the main reason why kind of, you know, the menopause society, the endocrine society, ISWISH, the OBGYN societies are all against the pellets because you get these hugely super therapeutic levels of hormone and that comes with side effects in some cases that are irreversible. So, mm, yeah, definitely makes sense now that you explain it like that. How about bioidenticals? Sure. What's the deal with that term? What does it mean? We get a lot of questions. Should I be on bioidentical estradiol? Yeah. Da, da, da. So if you can elaborate, yeah, that'd yeah, be great. So Bioidentical is a marketing term. It is not a medical one. So that's the first thing. So the big thing that bioidentical came out after the Women's Health Initiative here in the U.S. in the late 1990s, early 2000s, 
it was probably the, well, at the time, definitely the largest hormone study for menopausal hormone therapy. And basically, you know, without delving too much into it, the study was stopped prematurely due to some side effects. Now, these side effects were, you know, I mean, I guess, so basically you had three different arms or branches in the study. They had a control group. They had a group that were receiving estrogen-only oral medication. Uh, this was called Premarin, or it's a conjugated mm -hmm. equine estrogen. And the third group was receiving a medication called PrimPro, which was a mixture of both the Premarin conjugated equine estrogen and a large molecule progesterone, uh, synthetic progesterone called Provera. Um, and the average person in this study was 65 age, you know, 65 years of age, and they had on average been more than 10 years postmenopausal before they had started this. And the control group, it was a control group. It responded like they thought it would. In the estrogen alone group, they stopped it prematurely due to an increased risk for blood clots, like we were talking about, kind of the strokes and things like that. They actually saw a decrease in breast cancer and a decrease in colon cancer in that group and an improvement in overall heart health, but they did see that bump in those blood clot related issues. And this is because estrogen like any uh, or estradiol like any of the steroid based sex hormones are cholesterol in origin. When you take them orally, they get broken down into cholesterol. We all know if you have high cholesterol, it increases your risk of blah, 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 blah. Okay, makes sense, sure, but they stopped it prematurely. In the prim pro group, they stopped it prematurely because they saw an increase in the number of breast cancers with that. Now, that number was an extra one out of every thousand women per year would develop breast cancer. That's less actually than the risk of breast cancer related to smoking. But media got a hold of it. Oh my gosh, hormones are bad. Mm -hmm. Enter the kind of media personalities. The main one for the bioidentical was Suzanne Summers. Um, she was a TV star. And she basically said, bioidentical progesterone will cure all of your ills, basically. And so mm -hmm. that's where the people got, oh, I need bioidentical hormones. And, you know, for a long time, kind of regulated pharmaceutical companies weren't making hormone therapy. And so you were getting it compounded. Mm -hmm. And so I think what a lot of people mean when they say, oh, I need bioidentical is do I need a compounded hormone? Because you can get regulated hormones. I mean, a lot of the hormones we prescribe that are in the U.S. FDA cleared are bioidentical. You know, right. they're there. But I think a lot of people think, oh, I need to go to my compounding pharmacy and get this individualized mix of things. And, and that's going to be better for me. So that's kind of the long and the short of it. That's fair. And so when would somebody maybe actually benefit? from getting it compounded yeah. versus just, you know, getting it regularly sure, sure. prescribed. So compounding is, is great when you have a medication that the way, the vector that it's being delivered is not tolerated by the patient. So for instance, if I was allergic to um, peanuts, micronized like bioidentical progesterone the way that you get it has a peanut base. So I can compound that into a non peanut containing base and take it that way. Or, um, you know, we have a medication here. I mean, promethazine, it's, it's marketed as Finnergan. It's a, it's an anti-nausea medication. Mm -hmm. Usually it's a pill. Well, if you're throwing up all the time, you, doing a pill is not going to help you throw yeah, it up. It so you can compound it into a gel and you get the medication that way. So, right, so that's right. really where compounding really shines is, hey, I, you know, need this. Or if it's, you need like a, an amount that is not commercially available. So, you know, if you're saying, well, one milligram of this medication is too little, but two milligrams is too much. And it comes in a way that I can't, you know, break it down in half on my own. Well, I can compound one and a half milligrams of it and that will work out better. Right. So would it 
would it be fair to say that most people are good with the commercially available types and it's just, you know, kind of folks that have these kind of allergies that may benefit from the compounding? Yeah, I would, I, I think obviously there are caveats, but I, I think, yes, your average person, whoever they may be, will be able to get a similar, not well, will be able to get a, a beneficial result you know, that, that is not without any extra due risk or anything like that, other than just the normal medication risk with a commercially available, you know, formulation versus a compounded one. Right. But, yeah. you know, that said, also, yeah, like testosterone, we don't have the, F, you know, there are no commercially available testosterone formulations for women, you know, here right. in the U.S. So I literally, I mean, I have a compounding pharmacy I work with. I love them. They're great. And they do all of our testosterone. Like I compound testosterone weekly. So, I mean, I, it's not like I'm against compounding by any means because we use it all the time. Yeah, the yeah. Time. It's just there's a time and place. And compounding is oftentimes, not always for the patient, more expensive. Correct. So that's another thing to think about, too. We want to be prescribing things that are reasonable and accessible and then I'll reserve the higher price tag for when it's truly needed. Um, interesting about the testosterone because I was prescribed that, uh, again, not as a treatment, but as a, a potential off-label experimental way to help right. me. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, you gotta love all those caveats, right? I'm always very clear when I tell people that <laughs> off-label, experimental, very informed consent discussion with my doctor to help with some of my clitoral adhesions. And yeah, my testosterone that I had did have to be compounded. Mm -hmm. So I have a compounding pharmacy. I use it for my trigeminal neuralgia stuff. I have yeah. a lot of stuff compounded. So I already had one. She was like, I have to send it to a compounding pharmacy. I was like, okay, no problem. Um, and that's how I got the testosterone. So for most people then, if there's testosterone, they're probably going to be going, well, if they have a vulva, they're probably going to have to go to a compounding pharmacy. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah you yeah. can... Australia does have, it's called Androfem. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so you, as a provider, you can kind of apply for this. I don't even know what it is. I have it. Uh, it's not an Australian like prescribing license, but it's like some, something that the Australian government said, okay, if you're outside of Australia, you can apply for this. And then they ship it to your patient from Australia. Now, obviously hmm. shipping costs for this medication I yeah. mean, so you're talking about like a month of testosterone ended up being like $300, you know, right. but it was right. It was, you know, this is one packet a day. This is what, you know, it didn't have to be like, okay, I need one click and da, 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 da. Like it was, but yeah, you can do that. It's just, it's, right. it can be costly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's it, right? I always tell people these, these decisions are to be made between you and your healthcare provider and cost is one thing that you're going to factor into your decision. I know early on people said, why didn't you do laser for your lichen sclerosis? And I said, because it's like thousands of dollars per session and I don't have right. that money. And in Canada, my tube of clobetasol is like a dollar fifty. Oh no, exactly. So it was a no brainer for me as a, you know, poor grad student trying to finish up her PhD, it was thousands of dollars versus 150 like a dollar 50 for a tube that's probably going to last me a year it was like well that played a role in my decision making so we always yep. have to think that budget does play a role in whatever decisions you're making about your healthcare plan um as we kind of wind down the conversation one thing i'm curious to know is if you have any advice for folks that are trying to talk to their providers about hormones and hormone therapy and the reason i ask this is that especially young people really get blocked Right. A lot. So we bring it up and we say, you know, because I can be very transparent. I understand that estrogen is not a treatment. I have no intention of stopping my steroids. I would like it for X, Y, and Z. And they are always like, you're too young. You're too young. You're too young. You're too young. We give this to 50 and older. So do you have any advice on what we can do to kind of advocate for ourselves in these instances? I know it's tricky. It um, is. <laughs> um, you know, it, and I think it may be something, and I hate to say this, I mean, really trying to, you know, kind of find someone who is really comfortable, you know, with it. Um, mm -hmm. It's funny you mentioned this because I'm actually working on like a little thing right now to try it like that we're going to have on our website that's kind of uh, how to talk to your provider about these things, you know. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know. There, it, I don't think there's a golden, you know, ticket to it. I think it right. is something like you said. You know, if you have the data and you have a, you know, person that's willing to work with you, mm-hmm. then I think that can be super beneficial. Um, you know, I, it, it's the thing came across. I actually thought about you. A thing came across my email, and it was that Canada is now allowing United States doctors in. I think it was in. Um, where was it? I think it was in New Brunswick and in Ontario, almost like an expedited medical license. Uh, oh, so interesting. It, it was like like last week. And I was like, well, maybe I should get a Canadian, you know, like medical. Do it, do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, and the thought is like, well, okay, so here, if, if, you know, you say, well, I can see you in my virtually in my remote office in Ontario, you know, um, could you do it? So I really think, though, I mean, if you have your data, if you're able to say this, this is the indication. I don't you know, this is why I'm doing this. And you can draw my lab. It's not going to matter. You know, a reproduction age person like there are very few reasons to actually draw like, you know, estrogen progesterone on them especially if you don't know where they are in their cycle when you draw them that's like my biggest pet peeve when we get labs and it's like okay where were you when you had these drawn oh i don't know Mm, like mm -hmm. okay so how do i know if this progesterone being undetectable is normal or not normal you know so i think if you can find someone that is really cognizant of it i mean that would be the best thing to do and to say you know this is like you said, this is why I am wanting this therapy to be an adjunct for my LS or LP or whatever. Cause I mean, LP, you need to be on estradiol, especially vaginal estradiol, you know? So. Oh, because like in planets tends to really erode the, the vagina. That's why I didn't know that. I've always read in the context of LP that, you know, you'll do kind of dilator therapy to get the, steroid right. in there but i've never heard of estrogen That's yeah no the, so it's really almost like a, a triple therapy kind that makes of sense. yeah almost like you would do if someone had desquamative inflammatory vaginitis you know a steroid an antibiotic if they're ulcerating or they're breaking down and then the the hormone therapy too and then with lp like you said using a dilator to try and kind of keep things open as much as it can yeah, yeah, for sure. I do think the the idea of having like kind of blueprint on how to talk to your providers about X, I think that's still really, really helpful. And I think there's a place for that. And I think I always tell people like blueprints are blueprints. You can modify them. Right. So right. there, this is giving you a kind of roadmap for how to kind of move through the conversation. But then you're going to kind of customize that with your own unique experience and what's going on in your body. But yep. I do think it helps to come in really prepared, ready to kind of make your case. And of course, ideally seeing, I think, I think when you see vulvovaginal specialists, yeah. you have a higher chance of them being receptive to these kind of conversations. Whereas when you're going to your primary care physician or you're seeing a run of the mill gynecologist, you know, they might be more a little, they might be more inclined to kind of push back or just flat out shoot you down. I right. mean, the, um, the doctor that gave me the testosterone was a vulvovaginal vaginal specialist and I came in very, very prepared. And so she was like, yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, the risks, you know, the benefits, let's, let's, let's it. give it a shot. Yeah. yeah. And uh, luckily we did because uh, it worked. Yep, it does. So it really it was, does. Yeah, it was great. And I know a lot of people will email me and they'll be like, how do I get my doctor to give me testosterone? And so I, I, I share something similar to that. And I always say, you know, tell them that you're not looking to stop your steroids. because I think that's a big fear for doctors. They don't want to prescribe because they think you're just going to treat with something else. They say, no, you're not going to stop your steroids. This is why. Here's some light research. I mean, there's not a lot of data with testosterone yeah. and clitoral adhesion, so that one's kind of hard. But you know, everything really should be a, a conversation between between you and your doctor at the end of the day. So, speaking of, um, if folks want to work with you yeah. uh, and want to see you as a provider, how can they do so? And maybe you do see international patients, so maybe speak Correct. a little bit about that too, because I think that one's important. Yeah. So the big thing that we can do from a, a telemedicine standpoint, the kind of the way I think about it is a teleeducation, 
you know, type visit. So we can go and actually sit down, go over kind of your individual thing, answer any questions you may have about it. Um, you know, talk about kind of what are out there for therapies, things along those lines. And we can do that remotely, you know, whatever. For us to actually prescribe or to do any like procedures, obviously, we need to have you come to, to our clinic. Yeah. Um, now, what I have had, I, I, you know, a couple of my Canadian patients, um, I've actually kind of drawn up almost like a um, recommendation type sheet that they can then take to their local provider if they are mm -hmm. open to it. And I'm, I'm happy to talk to whoever, you know, I, um, you know, there is a patient that I had recently in Saskatchewan that I mm -hmm. called, you know, their provider or we, you know, talked about their kind of treatment. So, so that's always, you know, a possibility to do. Um, we are really kind of, you know, trying to give away, get away to do, this kind of big financing bundles to help patients come, you know, to us, you know, kind yeah. of, so you could bundle it all together. And then there are some societies out there um, that actually are a nonprofit. So the main one that works with us is called the Aziza project. They're out of, you know, Washington state and um, they basically, you know, they're completely nonprofit and all they're trying to do is help people with complex vulvovaginal vaginal concerns or gynecologic concerns in general, actually get to a provider that can help them. So, you know, they send us patients, a couple of other places, I think that they're sending, you know, across North America. So, mm -hmm. but that's another option too. Yeah, that's wonderful. I also didn't know about that recommendation sheet or that you're able to talk to providers. Mm -hmm. I think that actually that in combination with that kind of blueprint yeah, would be totally. really, really helpful because now in addition to me coming in with a strong-ish case, I actually have some authority behind me coming in and saying, yes, you know, she's not bogus. She's not making this up. Here's, right. you know, so, because sometimes that's what it takes, unfortunately, is that authority figure to come in and kind of validate what the patient is saying. It's unfortunate, but true, and that can hold a lot of weight. So, I think that, you know, that's great that you do that. And honestly, like, thank you, because there are, you know, I can imagine that person stuck in Saskatchewan, unable to find anybody yeah. willing to <laughs> listen, right? It's already hard in Saskatchewan getting doctors. Right. Especially, you know, kind of vulvar specialty type doctors. Right. Um, so doing that, you know, that could have saved her like so much trouble and like years of misery trying to fight for, you know, what she needs for yeah. her body. So yeah. that's fantastic. Is there anything else on the topic of hormones and LS that you wanted to discuss that we didn't discuss? I think, I mean, the, the main thing is, you know, you can definitely use hormones as an adjunct therapy. And they can definitely be helpful in reducing symptoms, but they themselves are not a treatment. I think that's the, the big kind of take home type thing with yeah. it. Absolutely. hundred percent agree. Yep. And then where can folks find you on social media? Yeah. So I'm at either on Facebook, it's just one word, Dr. Corey Babb, or on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, Dr. Dot Corey Babb. Perfect. Yes. And I highly recommend that everybody checks out both his YouTube channel and his, you know, amazing Instagram, TikTok. They're always very like short bites of information, very, very easy to understand, very entertaining. And I always learn a lot from your videos and I know a lot of people really enjoy them. So thank you again so much, Dr. Bev, for joining us. Um, and that is it for this one. We'll catch you in the next one. All right. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.